Yes, sir. Do it best. Yes. Yeah, cool. um, and this is, I believe, chapter 16. Six, yeah. <laughs> Section. <laughs> Uh, some of them correspond to previous chapter. No. But yes. What chapter is this? about the opening stages of World War II. And there's a couple of themes we're going to be exploring today. For starters, we have this idea of aggression. Uh, we kind of continue this with World War I. You remember aggressive nationalism? You have various empires being taken over by other um, more powerful empires. So didn't the Treaty of Versailles sort of say that was bad, we shouldn't do that anymore? did, yeah. But did all the European powers like Britain give back all their colonies? No. How come? They never lost Uh, partially. It was also deep as kind of impossible to just do it suddenly. Because basically, look at Reconstruction South at the end of the Civil War. You have a significant number of free slaves, right? What are they going to do for a living? What? I mean, ostensibly, ideas, you know, hey, we're going to give them land and they're going to have their own farms and things like that, but we're going to get that land. Well, so much land in the South. So what happened is, is that a lot of free blacks pretty much ended up as working for a wage doing the exact same thing they were doing. Only now they weren't being paid to the same level. So in some cases, life actually got worse. Not all of the cases, because some also took other opportunities, but it was, it was very much not well thought out, as long as short of it is. It's the idea that it's good, but we don't really follow through. So this was the concern that a lot of the world had, is, you know, if Britain just suddenly frees all of its, its colonies, what are they going to do for a living? You know, how are they going to handle that? So the idea is, well, we're going to give them time to develop until they can handle their own affairs. And some could argue that they really didn't even then botch the job, because there's many former colonies that are still struggling. So. I mean, it could have been better, but this was kind of the background behind it. Now, other nations, like Germany and Japan, who lose all their colonies in the case of Germany, or didn't have any to begin with, need colonies for their own continued development. So this aggression is them trying to expand and add colonies, but usually those colonies are already other people's countries, you know, in fact, they all do. So, this idea of trying to aggressively expand. And then we have to ask the question, how do the other countries on the world deal with that? And this is the appeasement issue. Appeasement is where you basically give the aggressive nation whatever they want in order to avoid war. Now, we've got all kinds of tools at our disposal to keep people from doing things we don't want them to do on a national scale. So for instance, if a country does something we don't like, we can impose economic sanctions on them. You guys heard that terminology like we're sanctioning them? You know what it means? Basically, it's an economic punishment. What, what, what could we do as a nation to punish another country economically? That's a straight up example. Yeah, not buy their goods. We could also refuse not to sell to them. We could also refuse to loan them money or any other types of things. The point is that we're trying to hurt them economically. The issue is if, what if they don't care? 
are pretty much our only next course of action is war. So what we're going to see happen is the nations of Europe appeasing the aggressive nations of the world until it eventually just leads to war, as we become realizing that no amount of appeasement is going to keep us out of war. Because the whole reason for appeasement in the first place is to avoid war at all costs. Now, why do you think the European nations are trying to avoid war at all costs? What does appeasement mean? That's where you're giving the aggressive nation whatever they want. Yes, why would they want to avoid war at all costs? Yeah. They Exactly. It's, it's, they're already having all kinds of problems. Who wants to repeat that? So what we're going to see is these kind of politics going back and forth. Those calling, no, we got to go to the word stop. Those like, really, we can avoid it. War is best for it. And eventually, not really having a choice. Let's start with Japan. Japan is a classic example of an imperial station. They need to expand so they can get resources. And Japan as an island doesn't really have a whole lot of natural resources. Uh, and so they're looking to East Asia, specifically China and Southeast Asia, to sort of shore up their weaknesses and go get raw materials. Which I might add is the exact same thing that England did, uh, only um, it's a different time. Things have changed. And people sort of realize the uh, inhuman treatments of the colonials was, was not acceptable. It's not acceptable. And um, Japan does some pretty awful things. Uh, one of the worst is you known as the Rape of Nanjing. Basically, Nanjing was to be evacuated of all Chinese. Uh, so sort of exactly the same thing that uh, Hitler was doing uh, with Jews in Eastern Europe. You know, we want them out of there. And basically, this meant um, killing them or forcing them out in any way possible, burning their villages. Uh, torture, rape, murder, uh, even there are some accounts of cannibalism. Um, so it was as much a practice of making people go away as much as anything else. I mean, if you find out that these people are doing these horrid things, are you going to stick around? Not really. However, a lot of people didn't really have much of a choice. I mean, their livelihoods are farming. It's not like you can pick that up and take it somewhere else, you know? They're kind of stuck in one place. So this meant that there's a lot of uh, murder and rape going on, and um, you know this became huge elements of propaganda in the West about why we just happened to stop the Japanese, and really fueled a lot of anti-Japanese sentiment. I mean, even today there's a big anti-Japanese feelings and anti-Chinese feelings between Japan and China over what went on in World War II. And the thing is, is like some of these actions, like the amount of cruelty, you go back and you think, my goodness, how could this really have happened. I mean, it sounds like something like someone will come up in a horror movie or something like that, but it, it actually happened. Uh, I'm going to show you a picture, in fact. Uh, probably one of the most gruesome pictures uh, I've ever shown you. So I'm just warning you in case you need to look away or something like that. Uh, this is from the Rape of Banshee. You're probably wondering, what? Really? This is gruesome? Um, but let me explain what's going on here. This is a newspaper article that was going around uh, Japan at the time about a contest between uh, two army officers who were having a beheading contest. Who could behead the most civilians in the shortest period of time? You'll notice that one of them won by 106 victims as opposed to 105. Uh, this had to be beheading with their swords. And people were making bets about who was going to win. Uh, you know, people were treated worse than animals. And that's something that, you know, I think it hit us pretty hard when we realized what exactly that means. You know, think of how upset somebody would be if you went into the street and decapitated a kid. You know, how evil and how cruel that would make that person. And these are human beings. And they're laughing about it. They're joking about it. How does that happen? It's not because the Japanese are racially worse than anybody else. And that's rubbish. We know that to be true. So how did this happen culturally? And this, guys, by the way, is one thing I think we as a society have to own about being human. Is these aren't monsters. 
they're not aliens, they're not sociopaths, or any other thing we can just easily put aside as being, you know, this was a fluke. Because that's what we want to do. We want to disassociate ourselves from acts like this as much as possible. The same thing for criminals in our own society. You know, because that's them, that's not me. And you'll hear people say all the time, like, you know, somebody is convicted of rape or murder. Like, you'll hear people, that person's just sick. But what does that do? It's marginalizing them. It's, you know, this is weird and strange. That doesn't happen in our society. But it does. And that's the thing, I think, that's truly terrifying. And also, that we need to understand. Because that means that that can happen here. It can happen to any one of us. Uh, put in another perspective, there was an article I was reading yesterday in the newspaper. I think it was from Daily Mail. It was kind of a silly news article. But anyways, there was a uh, maid for Adolf Hitler that she was like, I've been silent for this many years, 71 years. I'm finally coming clean about what it was like to be you know, the maid of Adolf Hitler. And some people were like, this is going to be good. It's going to tell us all kinds of crazy nonsense that the Fuhrer was doing. It's going to be wild. Turns out the only thing we learned from our article was, one, Hitler likes tea. And two, Hitler had a very rigorous diet. He was actually vegetarian. Uh, and so, you know, he, he, he you know, public beauty had this very healthy diet, doing you know all things. But he actually had a sweet tooth. And he would, like, break, like, sneak out at night, you know, in his room to go, like, wipe cookies from the, the uh, kitchen. Apparently, there was this kind of like wink, wink, nudge, nudge relationship that the uh, cook would bake a cake that everyone kind of called Fuhrer cakes that were sort of like a coffee cake type thing and would hide it in the kitchen so Hitler would go sneak and grab it like a naughty two year old or something, you know? And that's the thing, it's, it's like, say that about anybody else and it's hilarious. Yeah, it's funny because this guy's like, you know, 40 years old, he's sneaking in the kitchen like maybe would for 10 and trying to get sweets. But it also, there's a big uproar about it, and people were disquieted by it. Again, because Hitler's a monster. You know? He's this evil person that exists, but not someone who's human, who does human things like I might do. But we have to acknowledge that this is human behavior, otherwise, how do we change it? If we just say, well, this isn't human behavior, this is abnormal, then we ignore what causes it. And if we're going to effectively change society to keep stuff like this happening, we need to analyze it. Because the fact was, the rape of Nanjing was a byproduct of the militarization of Japanese society. Nothing more. Uh, and, and that's the thing we have to understand. Society influences us on ways that we ourselves aren't even aware of. You know, for instance, what makes something moral? What makes it right or wrong? Morality is something that shifts, you know, it's, it's, it's we acknowledge that sometimes things aren't wrong in certain situations. It is uh, subjective in the situation. And that's kind of hard for us to swallow because we think of things as being black and white, but our world really isn't, you know. So anyways, my digressing here. My point is, is that these brutal actions aren't just isolated from what they're happening throughout World War II. And because of totalitarianism and the development of these fascist states. Any questions? Moving on. Italy. Italy actually joined the Axis in World War II. And um, for most, one thing I've understand is what I'm trying to say is that the relationship between the Axis powers and the relationship between allies isn't really that good. There's a lot of mistrust. For instance, uh, it's Japan, Italy, and uh, Germany that are the Axis powers. Both Germany and Japan see each other as racially inferior to be wiped off the earth, but they're on two different sides of the earth, so it's irrelevant. But they have a similar worldview in terms of imperialization, so and it will be allies. Italy it's sort of a hanger on to Germany. They're fascists, they have that in common, that's about it. Uh, furthermore, Ger Germany really is the big brother in this relationship. Italy doesn't really um, sack up World War II in terms of what Germany does. Almost every time they engage in, a, in an invasion, they need Germany to come bail them out because they're getting their butts kicked. But they invaded Ethiopia in 1935 in order to gain revenge 
for their own loss uh, under Menelik II. So it's sort of this going back to previous wars, we're going to get vengeance for that. The current king of Ethiopia at the time, Pass Lacey, then is actually able to escape the country and goes to the League of Nations and is like, guys, you got to help me out. But instead of doing anything, all they do is let the sanctions that really don't do much. So again, we see this trend of appeasement. Although the biggest instigator that we're going to see is, is not the Germany. That's how Slavesy, and again, he gives this impassioned speech in front of the League of Nations about recognizing self-determination, but they don't really do anything about it. They don't have the power to really affect the change they want. This is really the kind of realization. League of Nations did not have the power and couldn't do anything. That's why the United Nations had their power up. That being said, one can to say say that you know, the United Nations doesn't have enough power to do anything. Now, Spain is actually going to uh, face its own problems even before the war breaks out as they undergo uh, severe political change over the 1930s. Uh, they become a republic in 1931, and then because of this clashing between conservatives and liberals, uh, it weakens the state to the point that a dictator by the name of Francisco Franco takes control of the country, who remains in power up until, I believe, the 1970s. And um, you know, Franco Spain was, was not a nice place. Um, only relatively recently have they started recovering from this era. That's effectively going to wipe Spain's power off the map uh, for the next few years. Uh, they still retain some power, but nothing like they were back in the days of the, uh, the golden age of the empire. But um, it's also kind of interesting because um, the Germans up to this point had been preparing for World War. They had actually developed several different technologies that uh, changed the way that war was fought. Uh, for instance, uh, when they were helping Franco take Spain, they used the Luftwaffe, or the Air Force, uh, to attack various villages uh, and utilize new techniques. For instance, um, dive bomb was one of the techniques that they used. Um, let's talk bombing for a second. If you're in an airplane and you drop a bomb, that bomb is going to continue moving forward. Yes? Because it's going the same speed you are when you drop it. So if you're aiming at a target, you've actually got to aim for a target ahead and drop a bomb trying to hit it, which is really hard to do. Dive bombing, on the other hand, works like this. You basically pull a loop-de-loop -loop and aim straight down and then drop the bomb. It's still going to move as wind carries away, things like that but it's a lot more stable and a lot more accurately. So the development of techniques, new technologies, uh, help them <laughs> to improve their war machine. They eventually developed a technique called the Blitzkrieg, which is B-L-I-T-Z-K-R-I-E-G. I need to fix my smartphone so I can like, write these things for you. The Blitzkrieg is lightning war in German. It means utilizing tanks and planes together in order to attack deep behind enemy defenses. So if you can imagine, sort of like a game, now that's a country. It's hard shell is represented by this line of defenses that's set up with the military. Well, what you do is you take your tanks and your planes and you attack really hard, just drive straight through the shell, sort of like taking you know, a, a screwdriver or a knife and just slamming it through the eggshell so that it gets inside, you can start attacking from behind and disrupt all the defenses and then move your troops in behind the tanks so that they can occupy territory. To put it in other words, if you've got a line of defenses and you bomb them and attack the tanks to smash up their formations and then move the troops in from behind the chaos, you know, you're able to occupy territory relatively unattacked, un 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 undefended. And so this meant they could defeat enemies very quickly. And so the Blitzkrieg is going to be used a number of different times to devastating effect. And they take the lessons they learned in Spain well. So Germany, 1936, invades the Rhineland, which is a territory that's actually part of Germany today. It's along uh, the River Rhine, and it's ethnically German. And what's interesting about Hitler's invasion is whenever he invades these areas, he's doing so with the military. 
when the international community is upset about this, he gets up and tells them, look, they are ethnically German. I thought you said self-determination was an important aspect of freedom. Should these Germans not then have the ability to uh, become part of the mother country that's, that, that gave birth to them? Shouldn't they be allowed to determine for themselves? And so on one hand, he has a point. On the other hand, it's still invasion. And so the West is kind of uncertain about this. And in addition, they really don't want to fight him. So they said, OK, fine. You can have German air. And so this is where the West begins this policy of appeasing the Now, one thing I'll also say uh, regarding this ideology of self-determination is that his excuse for using the military was that these minorities that aren't German are uh, trying to suppress the German desire to be part of Germany and are attacking them violently. We need to go defend them. Which, if anyone's paying attention to Crimea and Ukraine, that's exactly what Vladimir Putin, or uh, yeah, Putin was. Uh, this is not a plan, is it? Okay. Just so I, I was like, wait a second, that's all right. But he does the same excuse he's using, you know. Uh, which is why people accuse him of being like Hitler. You know, it's because he is doing the same types of thing. Now, in addition. Hitler is using the excuse of Lebensraum, or living space. Uh, you know, we talked about that in Mein Kampf. It's, you know, the German people can't feed themselves because you took all the land from us in World War I. We need that land to survive. So, again, there's some truth to it, so they let it slide. So, as we said, Germany, Italy, and Japan form the Axis powers because of this similar worldview of imperialism. And then in 1938, Germany annexes Austria. Austria, again, has its, its background of German, although, it, again, it's not part of Germany. It's not really German, but at the same time, it's close enough that people are willing to let it go. Then he turns his attention to the Sudetenland, which is a German area in Czechoslovakia. This is where uh, the British decide to draw a line. They say, look, you can't take Czechoslovakia. So, Basically, they meet at Munich to discuss the problem. Now, the British Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain, is trying to avoid a war, but the same token, he's sort of um, enraptured by Hitler. For some extent, Hitler's like, look, we don't want all the Czechs fought. We just want the German part because you know, they're ethnically German. We're just trying to put together a German homeland for all German people, and then we're done. Oh, I'm, I'm done with the rock, with the state. And Chamberlain believes it. They sign a peace treaty that says that, you know, we're going to let you take the state land, and that's it. And there's actually this famous speech he gives where he comes off the airplane, this Chamberlain, and he has this doc that says, well, we have agreed with Mr. Hitler that this is the end of war. It's no aggression. You know, the state land will become part of Germany, but the rest is safe. And people were all, like, static. All this newspaper headline was printing this picture. And they pulled the doc the headline, we kept this out of the war. Everyone was happy about it except for a few politicians. One of them was Sir Winston Churchill. And he wrote this scathing condemnation of it. It's like, you just made Britain look weak. And you can't appease him. You can't get in. Because he's just going to keep taking, you've got to stop him. Guess what happens? Hitler invades Czechoslovakia. Makes Chamberlain ruins his career. Uh, everyone is, is mocking him. It's like, you said it's, it's done. So he ends up losing his job, and Winston Churchill becomes the next prime minister. These are the maps showing the territories in question. Um, and basically, Britain, from that point, is going to take a much harder stand. Now, here's the thing. is Hitler wants to prepare in case of a world war. He doesn't necessarily mind one coming back. German people are kind of looking forward to World War II, kind of uh, get revenge for what happened to them after World War I. Plus, Nazi ideology was one of aggression. So in order to plan, he also learns from the mistakes that the uh, Central Powers face or experience in World War I. And that is by setting up uh, an alliance with Russia. Instead of fighting a two-front war again, 
we're going to make peace with Russia in case war breaks up so we can concentrate on Britain and England. And so uh, Joseph Stalin and Hitler signed an agreement that's a non-aggression pact. Essentially, we're not going to attack each other in case of war. Furthermore, under the table that people don't wear, aren't aware of is that Hitler and Stalin made an agreement to come together and mutually attack Poland and, and break it apart between them. Similar to what Captain the Great uh, did with uh, the leaders of Austria and Prussia years and years ago. So, with this in mind, Germany is eyeballing Poland. The Allies know that he's eyeballing Poland. They just don't know about Russia's agreement not being in war. So, they end up making an agreement with Poland. It's a mutual defense agreement that if Poland gets invaded, that will pull both France and England and many other countries into the war. So when Hitler invades on September 1st, 1939, World War II begins. And it is going to prove disastrous for the Allies. The Blitzkrieg allows them to attack much more quickly than the French and the English anticipated. And it's actually going to end up doing a lot of damage, because one thing that happens is they're preparing for war when it takes Poland, and they set up along the border of the National Line. And then while winter is going on, they're expecting the Germans to attack, and they don't. The Germans are busy over here in the eastern part of Europe with Poland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, as well as Russia and all the places. And um, nothing's happening. That part of the war is known as the phony war because nothing actually is going on. Then, in the spring of 1940, the war comes to them and comes to them hard. But that is something we will be talking about another day. Any questions? Fantastic. Yes, ma'am? Can you go back to that last slide real quick? Sure. Can you agree? Yes. No worries. All right, so while you guys are finishing up, and why the recording is still going. Uh, let me point out to you that I've added on a total of three challenges. I think I told you guys this yesterday, but I forgot about fifth period. So, you know, fifth period can hear this. So, in addition to the long haul, which we'll see ahead, I've also added a rate of knots and sink or swim. Uh, basically, uh, efficiency on distance, speed, and ability to carry weights. So, if you can beat me on any of those, you get the 10 points. Uh, and I will admit this, that um, I've seen ships go faster. Uh, I, have, I actually did a, a much better design on my, my hull, so I, I got that number up from like 42 to 65. So as of right this particular minute, the score stands in the long haul, 18,753 miles. The rate of knots, 15 knots, and sink or swim, 65 crits. I do know that one student from second period has gotten 16,000 miles. And I actually went from 16,000 to that school. So she's right on my tail. So, second period? Yes. Do it. Uh, I, I, I will not say. But uh, you can ask her out. She's, she said it's in the class. So. But that being said, if you guys help each other with designs, that's up to you. You guys are, are not necessarily playing against each other because you could all be that score. It just it might be difficult. I don't know. But anyway, that's it for today, guys. One more reminder. One more reminder as well. Your term paper due next week. Um, the last day you can turn it in to me for full credit is the ninth. And I mean turn it into me. I need a hard copy. You cannot go home and email it to me. I need the copy in my hand, or rather in the turn-in folder, by that date. Yes? So since we're not going to be in class on Monday, we can't turn it on Monday because we have the concert rehearsal. You can turn it in. Okay. I mean, you, you won't be in class, but just come in and drop it in the turn-in folder, you know? Yes. Yes, it's a work-sided page.
Now again, let me remind you guys, and I can uh, navigate here on the recording. Uh, if you go to Google and search for Purdue Owl, they will give you the online writing lab, MLA formatting and style guide. This will tell you everything you need to know and how to do it. So you can look up everything from MLA formatting and basics, in-text citation, uh, end notes, footnotes, all kinds of great stuff, as well as specific ways of citing specific things. You have to use all in-text citations, yeah. The entire paper is in-text citations. In addition, you must have at least one book for your work for your work site. Beyond that, beyond that, you can use whatever sources you want. I do need to know where they come from. It must be MLA. In so, text means that in no, in text means that you literally cite within the paragraph. It's a parenthetical oh. citation. So again, if you look to in text citations, the basics. You can scroll down and see what they look like, i.e. this right here and this right here. So do what it tells you to do and you'll be fine. Basically you just like put the person's name and set it or like the quote like the No, it's 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 not quite as simple as that. It depends on what you need to do. Basically, if you if you don't know how to do it, let me know, and I can help you to some extent. I will suggest that you also ask your English teacher because I learned a different style. I'm going to be honest with you on that. I learned Sarabia, which is the Chicago manual style, which uses footnotes. It's a little different. So if we like finish our term paper and we need help going back and doing the work, sorry. No worries. Now I will say this: if you're using websites. You use the name of the website, and that is it. It's super easy. If you're using documents, however, things you find on websites, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera uh, you need to use the appropriate citations. So, yeah. Again, if you have a question, let me just ask. So it's like actually in the paper, not people on the back. It's like a book. It, well, I'm, 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 I don't really see how that works because the entire paper is stapled to each other. So. No, 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 no. Like, you know how like the bibliography is like in the back, in the back of the paper. Yeah, like that's yeah, that's called the works cited page. Yeah. So you have like the in text and then have the works cited. Exactly, because in text is just short, and you're saying like you know, for instance, the website of Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. Not that you can use Wikipedia, just as an example, you would say comment Wikipedia. And then at the end, you would have Wikipedia and the URL and all the information. Do you have to do that for like everything information? Every, okay. You only have to cite if you are using someone's opinion or something that is somebody else's work. If it is hard and cold fact, as in it happened on this date, you're fine. You don't need to cite it. But if you're saying that this was very important, cite because that is an opinion. With me on that? Mm -hmm. Now, if it's your opinion, not the same as the person that you read on. If it is your opinion, you don't have to. However, and this is a big however, I find what happens when I say that is that people are like, well, I agree with this author, so that's my opinion. That's not how it works. It's their opinion that made you that have that opinion, that you have reaffirmed your opinion. So you need to give credit to that person for their mental for the process. If nothing else, when it out, cite it. I'm not going to be mad if you have like tons of science. I know some folks are like that. I'm not one of them. So if you're ever nervous about it, go ahead and cite. That protects you, one, from quoting incorrect information because I'm going to be like, why are you saying that? And in addition, it protects you from plagiarism. So it's never a bad idea to cite. Yes. Page number and of the book you got it from, and the author's last name. It's a book, or if it's like an online source, the URL. I mean, the URL, uh, the web page name. Uh, if it is like an article you got from online, you cite as if it's an article, a periodical, or something like that. And from there you go. I'm sure we can only use some called keys for writing books. Yeah, I think it might have something. 
Yeah. I'm sure she'd be happy to help you out. Okie dokie? Yeah. Fantastic. That's it for today, guys. I will stop this and post it online.